College basketball's opening weekend fully lived up to the billing, including a valiant comeback effort by North Carolina that fell just short. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. You are joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day. I want to give a special shout out to those everyday listeners and those of you hanging out with us in the Locked On College Basketball Discord channel. If you want to join, it is free. There's a link in the show notes on both audio and video platforms. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and you will get started with $150 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. So visit FanDuel.com today to get started. Well, folks, we're recording this on Sunday afternoon, a little bit before the start of the Gonzaga-Arizona State game, so we will miss the results of that game. A couple other games, but nothing super marquee going on Sunday afternoon, still competing with NFL Sundays, so you're not going to see a lot of big-time games on Sundays for a while, but... That doesn't mean there wasn't a ton of fantastic action this weekend. The three AP ranked on ranked teams that we talked about on Friday's show, all those games lived up to the billing. So we're going to talk about North Carolina, Kansas here in the first segment. We're also going to talk Baylor, Arkansas, and Scott Drew's team picking up a nice bounce back win. And we'll talk about the epic battle between Auburn and Houston. And then we'll close up the show with some other fun results from the weekend as well. Tennessee beating Louisville. North Florida now has a pair of wins over power conference opponents, UCLA. Well, maybe we were a little premature on thinking this team was back in business. We'll get to all of that. But Isaac, why don't we start talking about what was build coming into this season really as like one of the biggest non-conference games of the entire year. And I got to say, we got exactly what we wanted to get out of this matchup between two top 10 teams at Fog Allen Fieldhouse on Friday evening. Honestly, Andy, what a great opening weekend of college basketball, right? Like folks, remember, we didn't have it last weekend. Last Monday was the first uh, day of games. And so, man, to, to get to this point so quickly was great to have all these matchups this weekend. But yes, thankfully, <clears throat> all three of them lived up to the billing, starting with North Carolina and Kansas on Friday night at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Uh, Kansas wins 92 to 89. But man, if you're just box score looking, you might not have realized how this one almost did not live up to the billing with the Jayhawks <laughs> just getting out Andy to a really big first half lead led by 20 points with a minute to go in the first half. And it felt like Carolina. Uh, was basically like done and there's mm -hmm. the concerns you know about the front court we've talked about all off season uh, I think four different Tar Heel big men had two or more fouls and so it was mm -hmm. like oh okay we see this all coming to fruition but North Carolina battles back the fifth big man off the bench who we thought we'd not see much of any playing time from this year James Brown gets a, a put back at the buzzer to cut the lead to 15 and then Andy North Carolina comes roaring back, score outscores Kansas 58 to 41 the rest of the game, the final 21 minutes, including taking a four-point lead with three minutes and 15 seconds left. They still held that lead. And Andy, that I mean, just something I thought, you know, as we were watching in real time on Friday, I was like, there's no way this game turns into that. But at that point, the home team, the Jayhawks, execute much better in the final couple minutes of this game, retake the lead and hold on, uh, and they're able to avoid an Elliott Cadeau uh, attempted three-point to tie at the buzzer. Looks good out of his hand, hits front rim, and falls short. Number one team in the nation hangs on, and North Carolina uh, goes back to Chapel Hill with their fifth loss in a row to the Jayhawks. Pretty crazy stuff there. Andy Hunter Dickinson, I think, you know, is, continues to be the storyline out of this game. 20 points, 10 rebound, double-double for him, was in some first-half foul trouble or else uh, I think he would have done even more. But Andy, where, where I think the biggest thing, the biggest place we need to start is this. Kansas last year, our big conversation about them was how talented they were in their starting five, but the severe lack of depth beyond that, part of which was because multiple guys weren't panning out. Mm -hmm. Like, hate to dump on them, but like Nick Timberlake, like yeah. El Marco Jackson taking a while to really come around, like Johnny Furphy, who mm -hmm. came to, to Lawrence late and, and ultimately got there, but 
it was just uh, difficult for Kansas to really truly find that depth. And in this game, Andy, Zeke Mayo off the bench is led all scores for either team, 21 points. And so, Andy, as we start to look at this thing, I think a big early storyline for the Jayhawks this year is the fact that the, the depth that was so severely missing last year seems to be well in place this year because not only were there the 21 from Mayo, there are the 13 points from AJ Store off the bench, eight points off the bench from Flory Badunga, who, by the way, is I was super impressed with. Uh, I think he's going to be a great backup to Hunter Dickinson and is going to allow Bill Self to feel good getting his big man uh, some, some rest here and there. And so, Andy, I, I, I guess that's my question to you then is, do you feel like uh, this Kansas depth puts them in a, in a better position to be able to, to weather you know injuries and come what may as the season goes along uh, to put them in a better position to, to not only be the number one team right now, but on the last Monday and on the first Monday in April. Yeah. You know, I, I think Bill Self made it very clear. This was his goal. Like he said, you know, he had that kind of polarizing quote at the end of the season where he said, I've been thinking about the off season for a month now. And, and people didn't like that. And I understand why, but I, I think I also understand for him, like, and for coaches in general in the modern era of the transfer portal, like you got to be thinking about it kind of all the time, but he knew that that team didn't have enough depth and when those injuries happened and they just weren't able to, to kind of withstand them. And he didn't want that to be the case this year. And now you go into this season where El Marco Jackson suffers what I believe is going to be a season ending injury before he even steps foot on the floor. And yet you, you manage to get enough depth that you can withstand that injury and you can have games where, you know, you, you, you put Diggy Coyd in the starting lineup, which I'm not sure how much longer he'll last in the starting lineup. And he didn't, he didn't do anything in this game, zero points, Oh, four from the field. And yet you can withstand that easily last year's team when it, we talked about it a lot. And, 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 you know, again, kind of poked fun a little bit of like when El Marco Jackson was starting and wasn't scoring or when Nick Timberlake started and didn't score that Kansas team lost. Like they would not beat a team like North Carolina with El Marco Jackson giving you zero. And in this game, Dickie Coit gives you zero and Zeke may gives you 21 off the bench. Like you're in a spot where, you know, you, AJ store was one of the considered one of the prized additions in the entire transfer portal. He's coming off the bench and not even leading the team in bench points. Like that is an insane amount of depth for Kansas to have. And it's, it's so needed when considering what happened to this team last year, when considering just being in the big 12 and a big 12, that's now even better, especially at the top with Arizona in the mix. Like, I thought there were some really positive takeaways for Kansas in this game uh, because of that depth. I thought there were some positive takeaways for North Carolina as well. Again, their front court out rebounded Kansas. I mean, their, their, their team out rebounded Kansas, I should say 40 rebounds <laughs> for North Carolina, 39 for Kansas. And, and that's not what people expected when coming into this game and thinking, Oh, Kansas's front court's going to dominate Dickinson and Bedunga. And look, those guys were both great. They both had fantastic games, and, and down the stretch, Kansas was able to get the ball to Dickinson, and he scored quite a few points towards the end, which really helped put that game on ice for Kansas. But that only happened because they blew a 20-point lead, and that you got to give credit to North Carolina for battling back and, and putting themselves in a position to, to win this game because it's really hard to, come, to go down 20 points at Fog Allen Fieldhouse and then take a lead. Not a lot of teams do that, and it sucks to have not gotten the W for North Carolina fans, but I think you got to be pretty encouraged, especially after that first game against Elon where there was a lot of concern about how this team would look, particularly in the front court. Uh, to have rebounded in a way that they did in this game is, is a huge sign for them going forward. And Andy, I think a lot of it is some flowers we should give to Hubert Davis for <laughs> finding some things in the second half that he could exploit and then just keep going back to it. Unlike what a lot of college teams do in a very NBA sort of way, mm -hmm. uh, they were able to find some ways to just get Hunter Dickinson moving a lot, using pick and roll, uh, multiple screens, and, and getting him moving around and putting Kansas in rotation, and they weren't often able to recover. And uh, I, so I much kudos to Hubert Davis for this. And I know, you know a lot of people are like, oh, Hubert Davis and, and some of the start, but last year was his best year of his – uh, young coaching career, and, and I think we saw some big things from him on Friday night, and and some of that is Jalen Withers, who last year wasn't all that great for Carolina. Andy really is starting to step up, had a double-double against Elon, was one rebound shy of doing the same thing here. I think a lot of people are surprised to have seen him in the starting lineup now twice. Cade Tyson, Andy, played less than a minute in this game, and yeah. so I, th I think that's something the Tar Heels are watching for. Also, Andy, there, there's a curious thing where North Carolina does really seem to be um, going to stick with this three-guard lineup of Elliott Cadeau, R.J. Davis, Seth Trimble, all three of whom are 6'2 or shorter. 
and it seems to be working. Their their efficiency is wild with that trio, but some early season shooting struggles, 10 of 36 from the field for those three in the Kansas game, but 25 of 27 from just those three at the free throw line. And so you see some things there. Andy, I think end of the day, as you said, uh, good and bad from both teams going to be able to go to the tape and, and how beneficial is that for season long for both the Jayhawks and for the Tar Heels? I think Kansas obviously stays at number one in the new AP poll today when it comes out. And I expect the Tar Heels to fall because that's what voters do, even if you mm -hmm. lose on the road to number one. But I wouldn't expect it to be that far because obviously this is a good showing. Andy, this top 10 matchup was not the only. It, just, it was just like the appetizer for what we got on Saturday night, which was a back-to-back -back two top 16 matchups. And boy, was it a lot of fun. As you said earlier, Baylor rebounds from their blowout loss to Gonzaga and then just an absolute knockdown dragout fight in the nightcap from Houston and Auburn, and the team that usually does all the punching in Houston was the team that uh, ended that game with the loss. We'll get to all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you about FanDuel, y'all get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now, new customers, you can bet $5 and get 150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL, all right there in just one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more, all on the same page where you place your bets. Andy, tomorrow night is the Champions Classic. This early season event we all look forward to in the first game the Jayhawks that we just talked about are favored by six and a half over Michigan State I might like to uh, point out folks by the way that I quizzed Andy on these lines pre-taping and he nailed that one spot on so way to go Andy just want to uh, publicly give you all your flowers and then Duke is favored by seven and a half in the nightcap over Mark Pope's Kentucky Wildcats. So if you want to get in on that action or anything else, go check it all out at FanDuel.com. And again, you'll get started with 150 in bonus bets if that first $5 bet wins. FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and go make every moment more at FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Andy, it was the nightcap game at, in the Toyota Center there in Houston. And while it was the second game, we're not taking this thing in chronological order because with all due respect to the great Arkansas Baylor game, this thing was a high, high level basketball game between what came in as the number one and two defenses in the nation at Ken Palm. Uh, Auburn, Auburn is the team that pulls out this win. Andy Patton, 74 to 69 over Kelvin Sampson's Cougars. I, I think nothing less of either of these teams. In fact, I think infinitely more of both of them. Andy, what do you take away from this game where Auburn picks up its first ever regular season non-con win against an AP uh, top four team? Yeah, these, these both look like top five teams in the country to me. I mean, I think they've both been kind of analytic darlings for a long time. Ken Palm has loved Houston for a half decade or so. And I mean, the, the actual eye test and the results on the court certainly uh, indicate that there's a, a strong reason for that. They have been fantastic. They were fantastic prior to getting in the Big 12. They've been great in the Big 12. And, and Auburn is a team that has always kind of been higher in the analytics, higher in the Ken Palm Torvik kind of rankings than, than we've seen them necessarily bear out on the court. But these two look like the two of the five best teams in the entire country. And it was a, an incredible game, a fantastic, fun matchup. And there was a lot of kind of talks before the game. Obviously, the game was in Houston, uh, not at home for Houston, but still that gives them an advantage. Then Auburn has that chaotic situation with the plane where they end up not even getting to, uh, they have to come back after only being in the air for a few minutes because of a fight that broke out uh, on the on the uh, plane between uh, freshman Ja'Kai Howard and senior Jaheim Hudson, neither who ended up making the trip. Uh, ultimately, it was uh, chaotic when it first happened. I was very glad to be on social media trying to follow <laughs> <laughs> that storyline and all the speculation and everything that was going down. But uh, ultimately, a, a, a huge shout out to Auburn for being able to withstand uh, having something like that happen, uh, having a major disruption in that way and still go out and pick up a victory over the fourth ranked team in the country. Uh, Houston was missing Javier, uh, Javier Francis, uh, sort of. He played. <laughs> he only played nine minutes. Um, there was It was kind of unclear if he was even going to play. Ultimately, Kelvin Sampson said uh, recently he's getting better, but he's just not in game shape yet. So he's coming back from a groin injury that's been there for about a month now. Uh, it sounds like there's 
if he does miss any more time, it won't be much, but that was a tough player for them to not have for more than a few minutes in this game. Uh, obviously, when you're going up against an All-American like Janai Broom, who went out and had 20 and 9 with five blocks, 10 of 15 in this game, but he was 0 4 from three, meaning he was 10 of 11 on his two point attempts. That probably doesn't happen if Francis plays a full game, but uh, yeah, that's just the, the the kind of matchup between these two elite teams. One player being out for uh, the mo- most of the game was enough to, to give Auburn a little bit of an advantage there. Really like what we saw from both teams. And like I said, alongside Kansas uh, and potentially Gonzaga and, and Duke, yeah, these are some of the five, and Alabama's in there too, but these are some of the top six teams in the country. And it was really fun to see these two teams square off so early in the year. Yeah, Andy, I think the biggest compliment I could, paid to this game and therefore the teams and coaches in it is that this was not a November game. And by that, I mean, they were operating at, you know, you see a lot of these teams that are trying to figure themselves out that have brought a lot of new pieces in and, and there's some janky moments Mm -hmm. and we did, I mean, there were a few of those here and there in this game, but for the most part, I, you know, I told you before we started recording, you could have told me this was like a late February conference game. And I would have believed you because it was Mm -hmm. that high level in terms of, execution and cohesion from the teams and and sets and stuff and so really really encouraged by that and in the same way remember we just talked about with North Carolina and giving Hubert Davis some flowers for um finding ways to get Hunter Dickinson moving and keep exploiting that I thought the same was true of Auburn and the moment in the second half when they really took over this game was when they just were like we are going to put Janai Broom in position to make plays time and time and time again. And he's such a savvy player on both ends of the court, Andy. Like I, I was so impressed on Saturday evening with the quick, decisive moves he would make, um, whether it was scoring or facilitating or whatever it was. Phenomenal stuff there. Um, but maybe the biggest revelation out of this game was Tahad Pettiford, yeah. who I was excited about coming into the year. But I mean, he like rocket ship took off Andy and I, I am, I am enthralled with him so much so that mm-hmm. Bruce Pearl basically didn't use JP Pegues, the Furman transfer down the stretch, who is his starting point guard right now. It was Tahad Pettiford running the show. And I think a lot of that for those who watched it, I mean, you saw it, he, he handles himself and his game with the maturity that belies his freshman status. And, and that is massive for Bruce Pearl to have both of those guys. Plus, as you said, Miles Kelly coming off the bench. Mm -hmm. Good grief. Um, And and Auburn has other guys step like Dylan Cardwell looks great. I just, Andy, I I can't stop gushing about (laughs) these teams, man. They're so fun. Milo Suzanne feels like he's fitting right in at Houston, allows LJ Cryer to stay off the ball a little bit more. Oh, good grief. I'm so excited. Okay, look, I I could keep going on this. We probably got to switch and talk about Baylor redeeming themselves with a 72-67 win over Coach Cal's Arkansas Razorbacks. Andy, unless there's anything else you need to say about the nightcap game. No, I'm I'm all all ready to talk about Baylor Arkansas here. I think for for the Bears, obviously that loss to Gonzaga was was they kind of got shell shocked a little bit by a team that has so much continuity and experience. And Baylor was, you know, missing Langston Love and starting a bunch of new players, new transfers, new freshmen. And and they got kind of a, a more even matchup against an Arkansas team that is also, you know, all new players with the exception of Trevin Brazil and a new coach. And, and Baylor was obviously playing in, in Texas. So they had a bit of an advantage there. Uh, and this was a, a really fun matchup between two teams that are, are absolutely going to be better than they were. In, and they, they weren't bad in this game. I'm not trying to say that they didn't look good, but they're both going to be better teams uh, by the time they face or by the time we get into January, February, March, if they end up facing each other again, who knows? But, uh, you know, it was nice to see. I'm not surprised the Scott Drew team was able to bounce back. Uh, some other teams might not might have struggled to to feel the pressure of, hey, we can't go 0-2, we can't lose again, we'll be out of the top 25. And, and you know, I'm sure some of the players were feeling that, but Scott Drew managed to kind of get them to to put that aside and find a way to get a W. And and there's still some concern for this Baylor team, some things that they're going to need to work on. Absolutely. They still shot less than 30% from three in this game, seven of 24 uh, from distance. Uh, Jaden Nunn was four of seven, so the rest of the team was three of 17 uh, from beyond the arc. Uh, but we did see VJ Edgecombe kind of bounce back, uh, 11 points, <laughs> eight rebounds, five assists. That's a pretty decent line, especially against a good team in Arkansas. But he was three of 12. From the field, he was one of seven from three. The outside shot is just not there for VJ Edgecombe right now, and it's not only a concern for Baylor in the sense that they need some outside shooting. It's a pretty big concern for his potential draft stock 
if he doesn't look like a better three-point shooter as the year goes on. It's been two games, and Baylor has played better teams than any other team in the country up to this point. So I think that that needs to be taken with a fairly significant grain of salt. But, uh, yeah, I think for Baylor, I'm not ultimately concerned, and I'm, I'm glad that they got a W. But there's still some things that they need to work on, and they really need Langston Love back. 48% shooter from three last year. He's missed their first two games, and it really shows uh, in those box scores for them. Yeah, to your point, Andy, I'm looking, as you said it, Baylor at Ken Palm right now has the sixth highest non-con strength to schedule. And the five teams ahead of them, you ready for this? Maine, Mississippi Valley Step, State, yeah. A&M Corpus, Northwestern State, and Elon. Yeah, uh, it, would take, it would take me a while to scroll down before I could find another. Yes, Ohio State is the next highest mm-hmm. ranked at 33 of the major conference teams. Yeah. So, like, I, I think what you said there about that is a critical factor in that conversation. Like, let's not – like, if if I had offered you – Andy, let's say you were Scott Drew and I offered you one and one from these two games heading in. Mm-hmm. I think, obviously, you would love to go 2-0. Oh, yeah. But I, I feel like one and one has to be, you know, like, in a good spot. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there, there is that with, with the Arkansas side of it, I, I'm a, I'm a little puzzled by their production right now, mm-hmm. right? Like it's, I, I would not have guessed that a dude, the arrow would be the dude dropping 24 in this game <laughs> yeah. while, uh, you know, others weren't doing it. Boogie Flan continues to look great, you know, 17 mm-hmm. points for him, seven assists, uh, zero turnovers, five boards from the freshman, you know, yeah really feel good about that but just some concern over like john l davis eight points Mm -hmm. uh dj wagner comes back down to earth a little bit and so uh adu and brazil being non-factors and adu coming off the bench brazil coming off the bench is just like coach cowell has a long track record of Mm -hmm. having weird decision making with his rotations and things like that so i just I don't know what to make of what's going on with Arkansas yet. I think obviously we've got to get further into the season, mm-hmm. but uh, just some interesting things for both teams. And I think you're right. Baylor with Langston Love is going to look a lot different. Hopefully he's back sooner rather than later. Yeah, I just would add on that. Trevin Brazil, I don't think, came back to school to play. You know, he played 22 minutes in this game, but he's been off the bench in both their first two games. Uh, didn't do, I mean, he had four points and three fouls in this one. Like he'll, he'll get better, I'm sure, as the year goes on, but it's been interesting to see him not be a, a factor for this team yet at all. Again, only two games. Uh, so there's, there's, we don't want to make any sweeping generalizations yet, but Jonas Adu has barely played in the first two games. That feels uh, surprising as well. Just, I mean, I'm not surprised that he's given Ivasich a lot of run because that's his guy from Kentucky, but I, uh, feels like you'd expect their backup center to play more minutes regardless. So they're playing a lot of smaller lineups and we'll see how that ends up trading them in the year as the year goes on. I'm more, not only because Baylor won, but I'm more confident about Baylor going forward uh, just because I think you can see a clearer path to this kind of, this thing kind of coming together. Whereas with Arkansas, maybe it does, maybe it does. The upside's high, but, but I'm also could see a reality where it doesn't, and it doesn't mean they're going to be terrible or they're going to miss the tournament or anything like that. But there's there's more things that need to happen for Arkansas to be at the level that I think they're capable of, and it seems more likely that maybe they don't quite reach that threshold. Although I expect Nelly Davis and, and other guys to, to end up being better than they have been in the first few few days of the season. Hey, Andy, let me help you make your transition. You ready? Yes. You think Jonas Adu wishes he had stayed at Tennessee? <laughs> yes, Tennessee did get a really big victory over Louisville, 22-point win, spoiling Pat Kelsey's first big test for the Cardinals. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Mick Cronin and UCLA. Look, we were maybe we were wrong. Maybe we were wrong about being excited about a turnaround for this team after a disastrous season. They lose to New Mexico. We'll talk about that. we got a few other games to talk about here to close out the show as well. All that coming up in just a second. But first, folks, let's talk about game time because college basketball is here and there is nothing better than the atmosphere of a college hoops game. The anticipation of what's about to happen, the energy of the crowd, the unexpected coming to life, thrilling wins, agonizing defeats and more. And thankfully, there's a ticketing app called Game Time that helps you get great tickets at a great price. And great news, when you're getting your tickets for this year, Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks with curation that makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater and more. And whether it's Game Time's ticketing coverage, the lowest price guarantee, or the panoramic views from your seat in the app, Game Time has you covered. 
We're still talking Champions Classic. You can get $59 tickets to go see Kansas take on Michigan State and Kentucky at Duke. They also have some exclusive zone deals. You can click on it. You can get some for under $50. That's for both games. What an incredible deal if you're in the area in Atlanta. So, folks, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you will get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. What time is it? Game time. All right, Isaac, closing out the show as we do on Mondays, talking a six pack here for those of you who are new to the show. On Mondays, we typically do our six pack where we each kind of go through trade-off talking about games that happened over the weekend. Sometimes we mix in some other things. We'll do a recruiting six-pack, something like that. But it's just a fun way to close the show to kind of talk about things that we didn't get to talk about in the first two segments. So we'll start it off here. Tennessee going on the road to take on Pat Kelsey in Louisville. A real big opportunity for Pat Kelsey and the Cardinals to kind of prove that they're back in business. And it didn't quite happen that way. Tennessee <laughs> coasts to a 22-point victory, 77 to 55. Really nice showing from Rick Barnes's team. Uh, the common backcourt combo of Zakai Ziegler and Chaz Lanier both had 19 points. Both shot it really well from three. Zakai Ziegler did have 11 turnovers. Uh, I think there was a lot of positive things to see from Louisville in this game, but. The offense is just not there yet. Now, this is a tough test against a very good uh, defensive team in Tennessee. But the main concern for Louisville is the front court. I mean, they got outscored by points in the paint 40 to 10 in this one. They also got out rebounded 40 to 26. Not a single starter for Pat Kelsey's team was in double figures. Chucky Hepburn led the starting lineup with just eight points. Two of them had zero points. Uh, maybe needs to do some reshuffling there for Kelsey's team. Uh, Rain Smith came out coming off the bench, had 18 on five of 13 shooting. I'm still optimistic about Louisville going forward. It may take more than just a year for Pat Kelsey to get this team back to where they want to be, uh, but I'm not going to judge them too hard for playing a, a potential top 10 team in Tennessee. But yeah, the, the, the optimism that this team would turn it around real quick and, and pick up a big win early was sapped pretty, pretty quickly in this one. Yeah, I mean, that was – how about Pat Kelsey, though, getting out on campus? You see that yeah, video? I love it. I, gosh, the, it's just infectious, man. I'm I'm here for it, and maybe I'm a sucker, but whatever. <laughs> Bring me all the fun college basketball. Andy, the lone kind of big-time game we were looking forward to on Sunday afternoon, mm-hmm. Wake Forest picks up a big-time win, 72-70, to 70, over Michigan. The Wolverines, Andy, led by as many as 13 midway through the first half. They still led by 11 with like a minute and a half to go before halftime. Uh, but uh, the Demon Deacons close it to, I think, like four just before the half. Mm -hmm. Then you had a great, super fun second half back and forth where neither team led by more than six points. Uh, You kind of get into some late-game strategy down the stretch where Wake Forest knocks down most of their free throws. Hunter Salas missed one, but Mm -hmm. then they're able to foul up three multiple times and execute that well and get out of it. Andy, I think the biggest takeaway for us is something you said. Neither team right now is like, super, super good, like championship level. But the key is right now, right? We see some of the pieces there for both teams. Obviously, Hunter Salas is elite. They get other guys back like Efton Reed. But Andy, I think you and I both feel like the ceiling is higher for Michigan of these two teams. Really excited to see what Dusty May can get going. Is like feels like Vlad Golden, for example, hasn't really got going yet. So I'm excited to see him tinker and tweak and figure it out. For Michigan, really interesting scoring distribution in this game. Nobody had more than Roddy Gale's 11 points, but six players between 9 and 11. And it's that kind of thing that I think leads us to start thinking about that potential ceiling. On Friday, New Mexico played UCLA's 22nd in the AP poll coming into that game. And New Mexico comes away with a victory, 72-64. And look, UCLA was not good last year, and there was some optimism coming into this year. They made some key additions in the transfer portal. Tyler Bilodeau from Oregon State, Kobe Johnson from USC, Eric Daly from Oklahoma State were three of the big ones. But a lot of the same pieces were there from last year's team. And we don't want to make sweeping generalizations after one game, but... I think a lot of the problems that plagued UCLA really showed up in this one. They shot 
36 and a half percent from the field. They were five of 23 from three. They had 21 turnovers. The only thing that really kept them in this game was the fact that New Mexico had 24 turnovers in what was a pretty hideous game of basketball. But you know, uh, Dylan Andrews and Sebastian Mack were both back. They had six points, four assists, and nine turnovers combined. Uh, Ade Mara is a non-factor for this team. There's kind of hope he'd be a sophomore breakout guy. He had one foul in five minutes. That was about it for what he brought this team. Tyler Bilodeau looked excellent, but I'm, I'm not sure that this UCLA team is going to be at the level that people thought that they were going to be after such a disappointing season. New Mexico, they're a team that I think is there's some fair amount of excitement about Donovan Dent was awesome in this game, 17 points and eight assists. He did have nine turnovers. Again, it was a turnover fest. Uh, Nelly junior Joseph had 16 and 12 on five of nine shooting for, uh, for New Mexico. But yeah, maybe New Mexico is going to be a team that sneaks in the top 25 that does well in the, in the mountain West. But um, a lot of the optimism that I, I didn't have as much as a lot of others about this UCLA team, but it is gone at this point. And we'll see if Mick Cronin can find a way to get it back. Andy, who was uh, Tennessee's leading scorer on Saturday? Do you remember? Chaz Lanier. Oh, Chaz Lanier. Uh, where did he play last year? He played in North Florida with the Ospreys. Oh, my word. And and he was their best player? I would assume so. <laughs> and and he left to go to Tennessee? Yes. So North Florida is probably not very good this year, right? They weren't very good last year. Well, guess what, Andy Patton? In their <laughs> first three games of the season, they have gone on the road twice to high major opponents, South Carolina and Georgia Tech, and they have knocked off exactly both of them. An opening day victory over the Gamecocks in Columbia, 74-71. And then on Sunday, Andy, they go to Atlanta and knock off Damon Stoudemire's Yellow Jackets, 105-93. to This is an insane thing. Osprey's now 3-0, and uh, having beaten both those games, beat Charleston Southern in between, and Charleston Southern is regularly ungood as mm -hmm. they are again this year. Josh Harris had 22-7 and seven on 8 of 10 shooting against Georgia Tech. Look, Andy, it's hard to say at this point, is North Florida really good or are the Gamecocks and Georgia Tech just really bad? Mm -hmm. Either way, to go do that at an SEC and ACC school, kudos. Yeah. And oh, by the way, they got a chance to go 3-0 and on the road at high major opponents because now they go to Athens to take on UGA on mm -hmm. Tuesday night. So if the Champions Classic turns into a blowout, folks, you can go check <laughs> That one out. That's the fourth thing in our six pack. We got uh, two A10 results to talk about here as number five. Uh, VCU crushes Boston College 80 to 55 was the final score on Friday. And then Dayton picks up a win at home over Northwestern out of the Big Ten, 71 66. Uh, the two teams projected at the top of the A10 this year and certainly uh, looking like looking every bit the part with these two games. Uh, BC looked awful against VCU. They shot 29% uh, from the field, just 18% from three. They had 17 turnovers and just four assists. Shout out to VCU's defense, but wow, not a good start for Earl Grant's season over there for Boston College. Uh, meanwhile, Dayton picks up a nice win here, a team that lost to Ron Holmes, and there was a lot of kind of thought of, oh, maybe somebody else will sneak into that conversation in the A-10. Maybe it'll be St. Louis, uh, who's missing Robbie Avila for the uh, next couple of weeks, which is tough for them. Maybe it'll be Duquesne who made the tournament last year. Maybe somebody else will step up, but Dayton picking up a win against Northwestern is a really, really nice start for them, and it feels like Dayton and VCU, as they often are, are probably going to be the two teams to beat in the A-10 this season. Andy, I'm very excited. Dayton's going to Maui. Their yeah. side of the bracket includes Iowa State, Auburn, and North Carolina. They yeah. can make some noise. Okay, Andy, we got to end the six-pack here on something of a serious and somber note, something that we, as of yet, don't have a ton of information about, but uh, we would be um, doing a disservice to not at least mention it so that we're uh, making sure that everyone is aware of it. And that is the news that came out on Friday afternoon that Florida head coach Todd Golden has been accused, accused, hear me say that at this point, of stalking and sexual harassment. The Florida coach reportedly has sent inappropriate uh, photos to some students, including picture, pictures of their car, kind of following them on campus. Allegedly, allegations were known when Florida gave him his contract extension in April, and there are a couple other members of the athletic department that have been named in this as well. Um, Andy, again, we do not know much more beyond this right now. At this point, it is all accusation. And so we're not going to start speculating. That would be um, mm -hmm. also inappropriate of us to do so at this point for I, the sake of either side of this. But yeah. we do want to make sure that we are bringing it to light and mentioning it 
Um, but Andy, obviously, if if these very, very serious allegations are true, which are coming from, by the way, multiple women, yeah. uh, then both he and the athletic director and maybe others will have to wait and see uh, mm -hmm. need to be dismissed from the University of Florida. So we will obviously keep our eyes on this situation updated as we get more information, but uh, definitely something that we at least need to mention right now uh, in the early stages of it. Yeah, and that's going to wrap it up for us today. A, a somber note to end the show on, but certainly a, a story that we will continue to monitor and, and discuss uh, as appropriate going forward. But uh, yeah, that was a great weekend. Great first weekend of college basketball games and very excited for the Champions Classic to be coming up here so soon. There's some really fun week, uh, fun games this upcoming weekend as well. You got Arizona going on the road to take on Wisconsin. You got Alabama and Purdue facing each other. Some really fun games this weekend. I am so excited for us to continue to get our opportunities to preview those games, recap them, talk about what they mean in the grand scheme of things. So some fantastic stuff coming your way this week, folks. Thank you so much. To those of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day, special shout out to the everyday listeners, those of you hanging out with us on the Discord channel. Uh, we will be back later this week. We'll have Leaf back on as well. All sorts of fun stuff coming your way this week. Until then, as always, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, not Northwestern in this case, as they go down to Dayton. And until Tuesday, peace.